magnificent biography of this great man and written by an extraordinary author. And I have been reading this book for a couple of days and I can't put it down. So we will start uh, this uh, conversation by asking you perhaps the obvious question, why didn't you forget J.B.S. Hortley? <laughs> Well, he's unforgettable. I mean, in one sense, if you do even the most basic cursory reading of this man's life, uh, you even do the laziest thing possible and you go to his Wikipedia page, uh, the potted highlights of his life are enough to make you want to know more. Uh, this was a man of extraordinary intelligence and talent, a maverick, uh, who lived through some extraordinary times. He uh, was in the trenches in the First World War, he was in Spain during the Civil War, he was um, a, a card-carrying member of the Communist Party, often at times when it wasn't quite convenient to be one. He um, was suspected of being a spy for the Soviets by MI5. These are massive world events that he lived through and participated in. And then, of course, as we all know, he came to India in the late 1950s and lived here for the next, next seven years and became a citizen and died here uh, so, you know, even the coda of his life or the last episode of his life was pure adventure. So, I, you know, I, knowing all this or having learned all this and having discovered further that there wasn't actually a good biography that did justice to this life, I felt, you know, there had to be one that was written and then I figured I might as well do it myself. Um, I'm old enough to remember when he passed away. And uh, it, they barely made a ripple in the newspapers. Um, J.B.S. Holden lived, of course, in a very, very interesting time. Um, and his, um, your book captures, I may actually make a little comment here. Sure. Um, there are biographies of scientists. As you know, in our society, scientists are pariahs. Uh, we don't much care about them, and we uh, know that they are useful in some vague ways, but they're not part of our culture, they're not part of our lives, at least not in our country too much. Um, but the interesting thing about Haldane, that um, uh, Haldane's biography, this particular biography, is that it is not like any other biography of a scientist that I have read. Uh, to quote two very uh, successful modern biography, if you include a mathematician as a scientist, is the man who knew infinity of Srinivasa Ramanujan and genius of Richard Feynman. And both were um, a very entertaining book. This, however, <laughs> is <not> <laughs> an extraordinary book which you have to read over months. Um, and um, it has, uh, as a scientist, I would have to say that not only does the book capture this extraordinary man, but through this extraordinary man's extraordinary life, it also captures, uh, very broadly speaking, the human aspect of doing science. And what struck me most in your book is uh, his two passions, science and Marxism, and how these two played together, not always in very comfortable surroundings. And, um, you know, Holden's um, Lysenko affair, for example, which uh, many of many people know of. Uh, so I thought that perhaps, you know, I found, for example, in this book, very difficult to find his birth date and his death date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is how unusual this book is. Uh, so if you would like, I mean, this book is so rich and so wonderful that we cannot do justice in very short period of time. So I will pick a few things, but if you think that I am missing some very important things. You know, for example, his, uh, uh, his work with his father, 
his um, wars, his experiments on himself. There are all kinds of bizarre things that this man lived through. But what struck me most is this problem. I call it a problem. Uh, you have been kinder than that. Um, how do you feel his notion, the, your first chapter, the scientific method, and the notion that Marxism was, a, was science and history, as J.D. Bernal called it? Um, could you enlighten us a little bit about how you felt this worked out in his life? So uh, the book opens, I mean, this is unusual again for biographies. The book opens with perhaps the biggest mistake that Haldane made in his life, the biggest misjudgment, which was to, at a point, at a juncture where he had to back the integrity of his science or back the Communist Party, which was taking a different scientific line, a different line on genetics, his own field of specialization, he had to decide which to back, and he backed the wrong horse. He backed the party uh, for reasons that I get into in the book, but primarily, I suppose, more than anything else, he backed the party as many other intellectuals did because he felt that to diverge from the party at this point would give the enemies of socialism ammunition with which to attack the Soviet Union or to attack communism and socialism itself. So he took this stance, even though within the party itself he was arguing vociferously uh, against his, his comrades. But the larger theme that I wanted to use this episode for, I mean, the larger theme is this marriage of science and politics, this marriage of science and Marxism, um, that, inf that sort of permeated his life. Uh, and he thought, as many others did, that Marxism itself was a scientific way of looking at and ordering and structuring society. Marx himself uh, never shrank from comparing himself to a scientist. Uh, when he was being lowered into the ground in Highgate Cemetery, uh, one of the funeral orations compared him to a sort of social Darwin. So there was a very, very, de very definite comparison between Haldane's science and his, his politics. And there, are, there were numerous other influences throughout his life that pushed Haldane to be or want uh, the kind of egalitarian society that he felt Marxism promised. And for most of his life, he managed to keep these two strains of thought apart. I mean, the Marxism never influenced his own scientific work. Uh, he somehow managed to hermetically seal that away from any influences that the politics might provide. Uh, but his science definitely influenced his political outlook. Um, the question of genetic diversity, for example, which is so crucial to biology and to evolution, natural selection. Uh, this was something that he felt Marxism and then communism later upheld. The fact that you could be of the same class, but otherwise you needed people of diverse backgrounds, diverse modes of thought. Uh, so this is just one example, and I, and I feel even after the Lysenko affair, affair, when he backed the wrong horse later in the 1950s, when he quit the party altogether, he never entirely let go of the ideal that Marxism and communism promised. Uh, he never forswore uh, Stalin until the end of his days, which I think was a ma giant mistake. Uh, and part of this was due to his own personality. He was stubborn, he was a maverick. He delighted in being contrarian and provocative. And so a lot of this was uh, tied to that. One of his friends had the remark to make that if Haldane had been born and brought up in the Soviet Union, he would have been the most blue-blooded of Tories. He was just that kind of man. He just had to go against every single grain that he saw around him. I made some notes. Um, so I'll just make want to make a kind of a, you know, you brought this question up about the intermingling of uh, science and politics in, in his life. So in that, uh, there is a notion which some of us sometimes have difficulty in, uh, is the notion of objectivity, that one is objective. And if you see that the early days of um, the great ascendance of Marxism at the end of First World War, when large number of intellectuals totally upset with what the First War wrought, um, felt that perhaps the um, 
uh, Marxism would be the way forward. Um, so in your investigation, you know, how you say, I mean, I, I also agree with uh, reading your uh, book that you say that he kept his science hermetically sealed. Yet, it seemed to me that he was um, faithful to a higher truth. And that even when it come, comes to human welfare versus the dry field of science, he felt perhaps if the human welfare will be better served by something, even if he had difficulties with it on scientific terms. And he was ruthless to people whose science, quote unquote, were even slightly uh, deficient. He didn't find uh, this compromise. He didn't think this was a compromise. Do you have any evidence that he thought it was, he was making a compromise or he didn't? Well, I mean, I think he, Haldane's life was uh, the best illustration we have from the 20th century that you can, as a scientist, be scientifically objective and yet not confuse that with ideological neutrality. I feel those two are very different things. And it is a mistake that is often made now, and it's a confusion that scientists have made, I think, from the 1970s onwards, is that to be objective in the lab or with your work is to also be ideologically neutral outside the lab, in the world. Haldane never, never had that confusion. Many others also at that time didn't have that confusion. And I think there are a number of reasons for this. I think one of them is, uh, that scientists in the early 20th century were trained in the humanities to a far greater extent than scientists are today. What you have to do now if you want to become a scientist is to specialize from day one of year one of undergraduate education. Haldane never got a degree in the sciences. It's an astonishing thing. He never, he got a degree in the classics and he got a degree in, the math, in mathematics, but he never studied genetics or biology or botany. And so I think he carried with him throughout that uh, strain of thinking that, that science had to ultimately inform human welfare. And obviously being an intelligent man and being a well-read man and being a man of the world, he had other ideas about what else could inform and benefit human welfare. And one of these was politics and the organizing of society. And he, over there, there was no neutrality. There was no objectivity for him over there. He took a side. And I think that is something that is, it has been sorely lacking for a while, I think, among scientists. Uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. It is changing now. I think after 2016, when uh, people started to realize the kind of assaults on truth and scientific data that were being perpetrated around the world, uh, especially after the election of Donald Trump, I think there are groups of scientists who have started to step up and speak up for the data and for the information that they represent. You know, the March for Science, which began in 2017, and that continues as, a, as an annual event. This is scientists telling politicians and telling leaders that they are not allowed to misrepresent scientific data and information to their own ends. So slowly, there is a politicization of science and scientists in particular that is welcome and that is happening. Uh, but I think it would, I think for a, for a long time, scientists were fooling themselves that they could just sort of stay in their ivory towers and not engage with the extremely political world, world outside their doorstep. That's an interesting point. Uh, let me just um, contrast um, Haldane's because we are sitting in India, sitting in the city which he made his home. He became an Indian citizen. He held an Indian passport. Um, after the, just before the Second World War, um, two other great luminaries came to India. One mathematician, the other physicist. The mathematician was Andre Weil, came to Aligarh Muslim University, and uh, Max Born, who came to Indian Institute of Science. And they lasted only a few years. We managed to drive them away. And um, for Haldane, however, I mean, I ran into an extraordinary article which you refer to called What Ails Indian Science? And I think uh, it's one of the most perceptive and one of the most scathing uh, article with immense insight into the sociology of the society in which science is practiced. So therefore, 
you know, the objectivity of their work is certainly conditioned to some extent by, to perhaps a fair, fair extent, more than we are willing to admit for a long period of time, by the society in which they functioned. Absolutely. I mean, I think this, this comes up in art a lot as well, I think. There are artists who claim to be apolitical. There are artists who claim that they stand for no ideology and that they just want to make their art in a vacuum uh, because the art comes from inside. And we all know that that's inherently impossible. We all make art in a society. We all write books and literature in a society. We all are social beings and scientists equally so. However asocial or antisocial they might think themselves, however divorced from the realities of the world and the ideologies of the world they might imagine themselves to be, it's simply not possible to practice that kind of apolitical science, just, just as it's not possible to make apolitical art. Now that I, <laughs> I asked you to say this, let me be devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. And let me say that um, as a scientist, I think uh, from day one, we were told that, of course, there is no greater, and I sometimes say this to our students, that what was the greatest thing that Newton found out about gravity. And it simply wasn't that the apple fell on his head, but the moon is falling on the, on the earth and the earth is falling on the sun and everything is falling on top of one another. And there are no special laws of heaven that's different from that of the earth. So the consequences of science or scientific uh, knowledge, particularly during the European Enlightenment, gave us a notion that, okay, we may not have, uh, you know, a, our particular form of God deciding this or that, but we do have a frame of reference, and that frame of reference is nature. Mm -hmm. And the nature is the ultimate arbiter of whether or not what you said is nonsense, mm -hmm. or it has some element of truth. So do you think that this notion of nature, whatever nature means, and if I define nature as that realm when natural laws are working, um, does it not give some sense of objectivity uh, in, in some way? Do you think nature's role plays some factor in this. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, of course, nat natural law is natural law. Um, even in a relativistic universe, there are laws by which one must abide when one does physics or one does any kind of science. But the choice of what to study is a political decision. The choice of who funds science and how it's funded is a political decision. The choice of who is practicing science is a political, political thing. Everything is a political thing. Let me give you one example. Uh, we saw an astonishing <coughs> number of, uh, of scientific, and, uh, we, uh, an astonishing number of new di elements that were discovered in the wake of the First World War, of the Second World War. Uh, a lot of these were discovered in uh, nuclear reactors in either America or the Soviet Union. And uh, it's impossible to divorce that from the fact that these nuclear reactors were initially set up to do the kind of research that led to the creation of the atom bomb. Uh, there were indeed some um, stray atoms of a particular element that were picked up from the radioactive debris of a nuclear bomb test. Now, this is, a, this is perhaps an exaggerated but nonetheless illustrative example of how science and politics intersect. So the laws of element formation, the laws by which these elements operate, the laws by which the electrons um, form a cloud around the atom are all still natural laws, but the way in which they were discovered or revealed to us were deeply influenced by politics and, and by the political world. So um, let's get back to Holdem for a moment. Um, so, uh, Holden's decision, so um, uh, just for reference, uh, Max Born uh, came to Indian Institute of Science at the invitation of uh, Sivi Raman. Um, 
His stay in uh, Indian Institute of Science was anything but happy. And there are records of born Sommerfeld letters. Um, no, I'm sorry, born Rutherford letters. Bond wrote to Lord Rutherford regularly. And the situation he described in Indian Institute of Science is, uh, you know, anything, uh, nothing short of appalling, the politics that he, he saw. And there is a record, perhaps tomorrow there will be some discussion about some women scientists. Um, by the way, I should say that I'm amazed so much science has entered this literary meet. It's a great thing that finally somehow we are part of culture. Um, the, uh, the, there was, um, so Andre Vail, who was one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century, came to Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, the circumstances I'm not so sure about. But his stay was also exceedingly unhappy. He visited Satyendranath Bose in Calcutta. And Satyendranath Bose had a woman student named Purnima Sinha. I think we'll have a discussion about her tomorrow specifically. And she kept meticulous record of their conversation. And these are available for record. We hardly ever keep records. You know, but. And um, he also describes uh, Indian mathematics in, in very bad, says that it's very bad shape, and the politics, and the parochialism, provincialism, patronage, all of these things. And one gets a sense that when these people fled Nazi Germany to come to India, and perhaps later, as your book very uh, beautifully explains, how Haldane viewed India, and I'd like to call it Nehru's India, okay? Um, because uh, behind everything uh, is the shadow, long shadow of Nehru. Um, and so there was a kind of romantic notion of what India presented. You know, this, I'm again old enough to remember Panchashil, third, uh, the non-aligned nations movement, uh, all of which petered out. But nevertheless, there was a moment, one feels, that there was an extreme optimism about India, about you know, just becoming free and choosing to be a secular democracy. And uh, there was worldwide appreciation and hope for India. And Haldane took the extreme step of becoming an Indian citizen wearing Indian clothes, lived like an Indian. I have heard from you know, relatives about him walking the streets uh, of this city and then later in Bhubaneswar. Um, so does your investigation about Haldane's life and those times give you any insight into, I don't want to use the bad word Orientalism, but was there some sense in him? He was such a hard scientist. Do you mean, did he sort of become enamored of, a, of an India that he wasn't actually familiar with, but nonetheless had conjured up in his mind? I'm not sure that was the case. And f for one distinct reason, which is that Haldane had visited India before. Uh, in 1917, he was wounded in the First World War in Mesopotamia. Uh, and he was shunted off to India to recover. And he recovered for a good one and a half years. Um, in fact, he, almost, he reached uh, England again only why, by the time the war was ending in 1918. And at that time, he spent a, a lot of time over here. He was originally in Pune, but then he went up to Shimla. He went to Delhi and saw Jinnah in, um, you know, in the assembly. He went to the Kumbh Mela. He saw, um, he got food poisoning in Madhya Pradesh. You know, so all of these, it, it, and a year and a half is a long time. And I feel like his first immersion in India at that point intrigued him enough that he continued to study about the place even while he was back in England for the next few decades. And he came here with his eyes wide open. I mean, he was always sort of op alive to, for example, the, the dangers of the caste system and what that represented. Um, oh, I, 
I don't have a watch actually, but I'm sure somebody will remind us if we uh, go over time. Um, and he was, so he was alive to the ills that Indian society presented. He, um, he, uh, he wrote about them, he read uh, voraciously. He met Nehru in London frequently. Uh, and by the time he was ready to move over here, he moved here with a quite a clear-eyed picture of why he was moving. And part of the reason was all these ties that he had severed in England. He, had, he was estranged from this party that had been his own for the last 20 odd years. Uh, he, uh, you know, he was in financial trouble and he was looking for a place where he could stay and work at a relatively lower uh, expense. He was looking for ways in which he could find a lab that was free of political influence and although he didn't find it over here, he did eventually find it in Bhuvaneshwar. So he, he knew what he was coming here for and I think when he came and immersed himself in the Indian way of life, he did it quite naturally with, with, the, with, the, with sort of the mindset of somebody who has been waiting for it all his life. He had visited so many times in the 1950s even before he moved here that he knew exactly what he was in for. Let me go get back to this question of forgetting him. Right. Uh, we have a tendency of forgetting important people. Um, however, we have not forgotten Satyendranath Bose, we have not forgotten Meghnath Saha, we have not forgotten Homi Baba, C.V. Raman and all of these people. So what do you think about, and as a scientist, there is no question that uh, Haldane belonged in that upper firmament. You know, there perhaps wasn't a single thing, but if you take all of his work together, um, and perhaps you may want to because you write so elo eloquently about his defense of Darwin, um, perhaps you may want to s tell us a little bit about it, that it, it's um, that um, natural selection of Darwin. Darwin did not know genetics, uh, but uh, Haldane did, and that gave him an extraordinary advantage of defending this great idea, and he felt that if you didn't know mathematics, you were not quite a whole human being almost, <laughs> that mathematics was the essence of, uh, of uh, you know, human understanding, intelligence, and so on, or being a human even. And um, so, um, given that in our midst was such an extraordinary giant of a scientist, um, what explains this extraordinary forgetfulness of J.B.S. Haldane? I mean, it's interesting that you say that because we are actually sitting in a city that has a road named for him. Um, in England, there are no roads named for J.P.S. Haldane. There is no blue plaque outside the house where he was born or where he lived. Uh, in a sense, he is remembered more vividly over here than he is in his home country. And that is interesting because as you say quite rightly, Indians have a tendency to forget the people who worked among them and who did important work. But it, this is one of those cases that is actually the reverse. Uh, the example I often allude to is that of P.G. Woodhouse who is remembered extremely fondly over here in India and is quoted ad nauseum, but in England, uh, you know, mention of his name draws blank stares. So he's, he's one of those, you know, few Englishmen who are more fondly remembered in, 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 in India. Uh, but th there are two reasons, I think, why he is overall sort of not quite as well remembered as he ought to be. One is that his politics has fallen out of style. It was at one point, uh, exciting and interesting to be a communist. It perhaps isn't that much anymore. Uh, and so that is one reason. The second reason is something that Haldane himself identified while he was working, which is that it is the greatest honor for a scientist if his work becomes so canonical, so foundational, that nobody even looks at, uh, nobody even goes back to the origin anymore. It is just taken as sort of one of the natural laws of the world that you learn in the first semester of university and then go on to build upon that body of knowledge. Haldane's work was very much like that. Haldane's work, as you say quite rightly, defended Darwinism. It showed how genetics and natural selection could work in tandem. And he proved so many of these things and he, um, 
he elaborated on so many of these fundamental laws that they are now simply known as the laws of genetics or the laws of natural selection. And so I think that is maybe a key reason from the point of view of a scientist why you don't remember Haldane even if his work is quite well remembered. We are, we are out of time. Lo launch the book. So we have this, uh, this um, uh, happy event that this book, this extraordinary book will be launched uh, at this uh, venue uh, right now. So we will uh, not take any more time. I just want to end by saying that please read the book and you will not regret it. I have to say again that such a biography of a, as, a, as a practicing scientist, uh, my biography will not be written like this, that, that much is sure. But uh, such an extraordinary biography of a scientist as a human being, uh, I, I have to say that I have not read in recent times. It's an extraordinary book. Congratulations for having written it. Congratulations for remembering this great man uh, with all his warts and all his uh, difficulties. This is not the standard biography in our culture. Uh, so it's a fantastic opportunity to have been able to read the book and meet the author. And with that, uh, we should have the grand uh, function of releasing the book. Let's welcome an eminent economist and author, Mr. Bibek Devroy, onto the stage with a huge round of applause. He shall now be launching the book, J.B.S. Holden, A Dominant Character. So if you would like to share a few words. No, thank you, but I would not like to share a few words because I am not a scientist as you yourself announced. I don't have the expertise to talk about J.B.S. Holden. I'm inclined to think that the only reason I've been asked to launch the book is because of my association with the Indian Statistical Institute and the director of the Indian Statistical Institute is also here. I heard a large part of the discussion. And A, it is indeed true, and please correct me if I am wrong. Well, you yourself said that. That no good biography of Holden's exists. There was something I vaguely remember by Ronald Clark, is that right? And then his student, Dronam Raju, wrote stuff about him. He himself wrote a little bit about his family. But everything that I've read so far is about his work. I've read very little about, apart from the polit politics part of it, about him as an individual. And writing a proper, proper biography is extremely, extremely tough. Very few people are competent to write good biographies which bring out the individual. I haven't read the book. I was hoping I'd get a copy as a result of the launch. I'm not going to get one, so I shall acquire one. But from what I've read of his work earlier, he is indeed eminently, eminently qualified to write such a biography. And I've read a couple of reviews of the book also. So I endorse what has just been said, that please do read the book. But I do also happen to think that it might have been more in the fitness of things if this book was launched in Bhubaneswar rather than Kolkata, although there is a road named after him here. So maybe there will be a second launch in Bhubaneswar. Heaven knows whether there will be a launch in Oxford. I doubt it very much, but certainly in Bhubaneswar. And thank you once again for having written the book. I look forward to reading it.
I'm sure the author would be happy to take a few questions. Any questions from the audience? Anything from Indian Statistical Institute? about uh, his association with the Indian Statistical Institute. I'm sure it must be there in your book, but because I understand you've researched some of, uh, some of the things that went on when he was in ISI. You were visiting our archives also, I believe. Our chief librarian was telling. And uh, the interesting part which I found out was, uh, it's very usual, the, the divorce between Mohalanabis and Haldane. That's how relationships break over very trivial and very small things, like curtains, <laughs> like who's going to uh, fund the travel of a fellow um, uh, researcher, or signing of the attendance register, uh, display of a bone, of uh, a dinosaur foss uh, a fossilized bone, uh, whether it would be displayed or not. So these were the small things uh, because of which there were disagreements, discontent, and which led to uh, the Haldanes leaving Kolkata and going away to, uh, leaving Indian Statistical Institute and going away to uh, Bhubaneswar. But of course, I mean, I think uh, both Mohalan Abis and Haldane had great respect for each other till the very end of their intellectual capabilities. And uh, what I also, uh, I think we should give them the space. I mean, I was just wondering these trivial things if they had resolved what could have happened because Haldane's one major contribution was the design of the BSTAT course, Bachelor of Statistics course in Indian Statistical Institute in the 1960s, uh, which was truly multidisciplinary. A person, because as you correctly pointed out, Haldane uh, was of the opinion that everything should have mathematics and statistics in it, uh, even in your thought process for the benefit of the country. And that's how the BSTAT course was designed. Of course, it had statistics, mathematics, it had a lot of biology, a lot of physics, a lot of humanity. So all natural social sciences, uh, those subjects were incorporated in that. It was very heavy course. But that's how we still have the BSTAT course, which is very popular, one of the flagship courses of the in institute. But I was just thinking, had they not uh, fallen apart, their relationship, I mean, uh, maybe we would have a lot more. But that's how it is. We give them their space and respect their decisions. Uh, what do you think? I would just like to ask, because I was looking up some certain letters, what do you think was the influence of his wife on Haldane? Uh, uh, Helen. Uh, well, I mean, so Helen was his, his second wife. I mean, his first wife was instrumental in him moving into the Communist Party. The second wife was instrumental in him moving to India. Um, he used to write to Mahalan Obis even in the 1950s, after they had come here on a few short tours, he would write to Mahalan Obis saying, Helen is homesick for India. Which sounds very odd because Helen was not Indian, she was English. But, uh, but I think she really, she found work that she could do here. Unlike Haldane who worked with pen and paper and mathematics, Helen was largely um, an observer of the natural world and where better to do that than in India. So, and he moved to ISI and to Calcutta only after being assured that there was a position for her here as well. So, you know, throughout all of this, throughout the, the transition from England to India, uh, his wife was front and center and what she could do and what she wanted to do, both were extremely important um, to him. And finally, his departure from ISI, you know, I mean, it wasn't just Haldane who fell out with Mahalo Nobis, it was Helen as well, to a certain extent. Uh, in fact, one may say the crisis, the final crisis that drove them out of ISI was precipitated by Helen. Uh, and Haldane defended her, you know, come hell or high water, as I guess every husband ought to do with his wife. And, uh, and so they left. And I think he, he came to her quite late in life. He was already in his, uh, let me think, late 40s, early 50s by the time they got married and so on. But uh, she was indispensable to him throughout the end of his days. Uh, just like to mention one or two things, which is that... Um I've not had a chance to read the book, and I'm, I'm certainly eagerly going to read it. So uh, let's, let's. The only thing I'm a little um, surprised at your surprise is that Cambridge in the late 40s, 1950s was a hotbed of communism. I mean, uh, famously, Burgess, McLean, Philby, Blunt, they all came from that era. And um, 
even by the 50s, the fallout from the nuclear program, the Manhattan Project, famously, of course, Oppenheimer physicists, I should say, Oppenheimer, and many of the people ended up in Cambridge. And I'm, I date from the early 60s as a physicist in the Cambridge, and there's no way that any of us would ever have worked for anything which could have been used in aggression, whether in, in weaponry or, or aircraft. So I think all I'm saying is I've not had a chance to read it yet. But Cambridge was an atmosphere then, and perhaps even so now, which did breed this very left-wing views, um, and particularly very staunch communism, as, as you possibly know in the late 40s, early 50s. Just, just a comment. No, no, that's true. Um, Haldane moved out of Cambridge in 1934. Uh, he went to University College London, uh, and that, would, that is where he would stay until he left in 1957 to come to India. Uh, he was 65 at the time, so it was retirement age, and he, he, he was going to leave anyway, I think. But it, this move to India was unexpected. Um, no, I guess, I mean, my, uh, my surprise was not about his movement into the left at all. I mean, I think, and in fact, I do catalog in the book how the atmosphere at Cambridge in the early 1930s helped foment this particular political inclination in Haldane. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm, but, but a lot of the people, a lot of the scientists who were in Cambridge at the time, uh, their science was, you know, you may say quite rightly, they would not have worked for in the in scientific fields that eventually channel their research into military or defense purposes, and that's quite right, I think. But the, the soundness of their science was quite untouched by their, by their political leanings. And I'm comparing this to the Soviet Union, where this big Lysenko affair that erupted in the late 1940s was a perfect example of how scientific research itself could be compromised by the political uh, environment around you. Any other question? In that case, I, as uh, the conversation person, uh, take the last word. Um, I'm a physicist, and um, in physics circles, um, Haldane is not known for being a great geneticist. Uh, he is best known for a, an article called Being the Right Size. Okay, and it's available on the net, and what he does in it is um, something that every physics student ought to know, and what he does is he looks at the dimensions of various animals, all the way from insect to large animals, and explains why their size is right for how they live. It's roughly a surface to volume ratio argument, but uh, it's an, uh, every physics student, if you want to do a PhD, you must read that, not just for the inside, because he was ahead of scaling by 50 years or so, but uh, how to write. <laughs> and he was a master of how to write, and physics students increasingly seem to have forgotten how to write. So if there are physics students here, I will say that he is a great example of how to write. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful book. Uh, we obviously cannot conclude this session without some words from Ms. Shongamitra Bondupadhyay. Ma'am, if you would want to talk about Haldane and his relationship with ISI, I mean, we'd love for you to come and share a few words. Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's have a huge round of applause for our panelists. And as a token of appreciation, we also have some small gifts from our title sponsor, Tata Steel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sirs. We shall be ready shortly for the next session.